Oh yeah, thank you for turning on the DVD. So it's Marcus and I again, and uh, we're luxuriating in this beautiful place to remind us of the luxury that Esther, uh, the book of Esther, is set in. Uh, Act one, scene one, it's all a bit of a play. They celebrate it with a play. Act one, scene one is a banquet, and it's a luxury banquet uh, that says, uh, verse chapter one, verse four, it lasted a full 180 days. That's a lot of days uh, for a banquet. And, and at this banquet, there was just this massively ostentatious display of wealth and power. And, and the whole thing is designed to keep everyone in check. So all the nobles, the military leaders, the officials, everyone was there in order to keep the glass ceiling on top of them, to show them who really was in charge. What better way to end a 180 day banquet than a seven day banquet? And so they hold a seven day banquet with everyone from the whole place, the whole, um, the whole place of, uh, of Susa. And, and so everybody, most of whom have never been to a royal palace before, is overwhelmed with the ivory and the mother of pearl and the gold, the, the gold settees, but much like this one. And the, the, just the general wealth of the place. And again, it's all designed to keep people in their place. I wonder what's happened to keep you in your place, the glass ceiling that we, we all have. Yeah, it's interesting how they used all of this pomp and ceremony. I was reading about um, the silver and the purple linens that were thrown about the place and how behind that all, behind that amazing you know, feast, there was this rigidity to the system um, and you know, the king wanted to make sure that his power was known and that, you know, there was a certain way of doing things. Absolutely. So he calls for his wife, who's got a, um, she's a bit of a trophy wife. She's meant to be very beautiful. She, she's got her own feast happening next door for the women because that's where the women is, although they're in his palace. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he calls for her to come and put her crown on. He's drunk at the end of the seven days of feasting the whole village is drunk and he wants to parade his wife and uh, the rabbi said that it says in the scripture that he wanted her to wear a crown um, the rabbi said that that was the only thing she was going to wear and so this woman was meant to be dragged in to these drunken men uh, to be leered at and and she says no and it sends the whole thing into a spin. The whole, the whole system, as you say, begins to crumble because suddenly there's, there, there's panic because she has said no. She's tried to break through the glass ceiling. Mm, and the king's completely furious with the whole thing. And um, yeah, I'm sure you've yeah. said this a bit about that. But, um, you know, the whole everything that they'd worked towards for the whole 180 days and after these seven days is completely... Absolutely. Smashed to pieces. It's because farcical, of and that's one of the things about glass ceilings is that they're very brittle. They're very mm. small. They're very farcical. When the Jews celebrated Esther, they they did it as a comedy. They did it as a pantomime. They they did it as a uh, so they dressed the evil characters up in ridiculous clothes to to show how pathetic the the glass ceilings are. And uh, for many of us as we hear the word that God is breaking glass ceilings, we need to put those things into perspective to see how, how God is able to do that, how he is able to break through even the biggest of the bluster and the, 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 the pretense and the ostentatious displays that God can break through that for you. Yeah, there's been a lot of um, prophetic words recently in church in all, across all the services. Um, and for this season in the church that, you know, we're breaking through those glass ceilings um, and they are fragile because, you know, even with the whole facade of everything looking nice, um, this one small action threatened it massively, yeah. through the whole thing, yeah. so yeah. 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 So the, a couple of things about it, Vashti actually says no and then gets banished, you know, there might be a false start. We need to recognise that, that sometimes the, the, the powers that keep us down, the lies that we've told ourselves, the lies that other people tell us, the society that blocks us in, that sometimes when we try and break through there's a false start. Um, but the story of Esther is that 
we don't give up hope. You know, we keep pushing through. We are expecting God to be working. And that, that's the second thing about Esther, really, is that, that God is working behind the scenes. He's hidden in Esther, isn't he? There's... Yeah, Esther's the only book in the Bible where, you know, God is not mentioned at all. But obviously we know from the story, if we look ahead and flick through the next couple of pages, we know that God's working. Um, and it was the same with Jesus. They were expecting a king and they didn't get one. Um, they got Jesus, who didn't look like a king. But that was so much greater. Yeah, yeah, which is, you know, your redemption, your breakthrough might come from a very unexpected place. So it's very fragile. God is working even though he's hidden. And your breakthrough might come from a very unexpected place. But this is the season for God to break glass ceilings. Have a good time as you talk about this stuff. Thanks, Marcus. Thank I'm loving the pink, by the way. Well done. Thanks. See you in a bit. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.